Thanks, Dr. Calabrese. Um, yeah, uh, you know, I, uh, on occasion I show my total lack of social skills. And um, uh, there, there, you mentioned this idea that uh, we used to think that people who had silent things would be non-adherent. People who had things that were bothering them would use their medicines because it, they're bothering them. You know, I, I went to medical school in the early 80s. We used a book, Goodman and Gilman, for pharmacology. Told us everything you could possibly want to know about, you know, drug metabolism, things that affected blood levels, first pass metabolism, urinary excretion. I don't remember it discussing any of the three most important factors that determine blood levels in actual patients, which are compliance to treatment, compliance to treatment, and compliance to treatment. But I do remember one time the issue of adherence came up in, um, in my medical school. I was a, in my final year of, of, of medical school at Duke. I was on my uh, you know, uh, internal medicine rotation. And uh, I was responsible for the care of a patient with um, a sexually transmitted disease. I can't remember which one it was. But the night before, like, you know, the the gunner medical student I was at the time, I you know, read everything I could find on, on venereal diseases so that I'd be ready when they pimped me on internal medicine grand rounds the next morning. And I remember very clearly reading about the treatment of gonorrhea, that you could treat gonorrhea by taking an antibiotic pill twice a day. Well, that if you took, if you took an antibiotic pill twice a day for one week, you could cure gonorrhea. Do we treat people with an antibiotic pill twice a day for a week for gonorrhea? Anybody know? No, what do we do? Yeah, we give a couple shots in the butt, right? And the reason for this was you could not count on patients to be adherent to their topical antibiotic pill twice a day for one week. Now, the things we ask people to do in GI room and certainly in dermatology is much harder than taking a pill twice a day for one week. You know, so we're asking people to do stuff that's harder. Now, the question is, is their quality of life in these diseases so much worse than gonorrhea that we can count on them to do it? Now, I don't know about you, but if I had this painful, purulent drip coming out, I would think it would be psychosocially disabling. You know, I would think that I would want it to get well. And yet we can't count on people with this, you know, to take either their antibiotics for one week. So can we really expect, you know, patients who are, have bad diseases to take pills or injections for the rest of their lives? And the answer, I think, is no. You know, I, I'm a, a, a trained as a protein chemist, a relative newcomer to the idea of adherence. I, I just became interested in this because my patients with psoriasis weren't getting well. I used to think of adherence as being very straightforward. It's, the, the, you know, the percentage of doses that a patient takes. But I think that it's helpful to think of it in a little more granular fashion. You have, a, 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 some, some, a patient is given a prescription at some point. You give the patient a prescription. And at some point, they may fill the prescription. They may not fill it. We, we might call that primary non-adherence. They never even start on the medicine. Now, let's assume they fill it at some point and they start on treatment. Well, then they're going to be on treatment for a certain period of time. And during that period of time that they're using the medicine, they may use it well or they may use it poorly. And then, at some point, they discontinue the treatment, and it may not be when they were supposed to. And in dermatology, I think we have problems at all these levels. I, I got very lucky. One day, one of my research colleagues at Wake Forest uh, Raj Balkrishnan, who went on to go to Houston and Michigan, Ohio State. Um, Raj told me about the company that sells these medicine bottle caps that contain computer chips that record the day and time each time the bottles are opened and closed. And, I, and uh, boy, did that change my life. You know, as soon as, I, as soon as he said that, I was like, they make what? You know, I, I turned to my research fellow. I said, I don't care what they cost. We need to find out what my patients with psoriasis are doing. Uh, so we would incorporate these into studies. In a typical study, we would tell patients, put this medicine on twice a day. 
We're going to monitor your use of the medicine. So fill out this daily diary and bring the bottles back for us to weigh. And so you could see the IRB was fine. We told them we were monitoring them. We just didn't mention the computer chips were part of the process. Here we have the actual diary from a patient in one of our trials. This is a fairly anal retentive patient who records the dosing time to the nearest five minutes. If they make a mistake, they correct it. If they took an Advil or a Tums that day, they wrote that in too. And according to the computer chips, they took their medicine twice a day, pretty much every day over the course of the study. Here's another diary from one of the patients in this uh, first study of topical therapy for psoriasis. This diary doesn't look like the other diary, does it? First of all, it's not filled out quite so compulsively. Instead of filling out to the nearest five minutes, they fill things out generally to the nearest hour. It's funny, though. Doesn't it look like they... One of the amazing things about this diary is they managed to use the same pen every day for the entire month. You know? Isn't that, isn't that funny? You know, it kind of looks like what it might look like if you were sitting in the um, car. You're sitting in your car on the way to, you know, for your um, next you know, the end of study visit, and you're going to turn in the diary and just fill it out all at once. Doesn't it look kind of like that? Here's what this patient actually did. According to the computer chips, they almost never opened the bottle. This is in a research study that they weren't using the medicine. Uh, in this, uh, my research fellow, uh, who knows my, my love of, of uh, adherence and things like this, um, gave me this diary that was... Um, well, from, a, from a different study, um, this, this was a once-a-day study. You could see each day of the study, they're supposed to check off whether they use the medicine or not. This patient, as you can see at the top, the, the, the date of last study product application was the 9th of November, 2010. Uh, the patient had come in on that day for an early termination visit. You'll notice that they completed the diary out to the 16th of November, even though they came in on November 9th to end the study. Patients will do the darndest thing sometimes. So, you know, when I see patients with psoriasis and I make the diagnosis and I prescribe a treatment, there's three main reasons things might not get better. Number one, poor compliance. Number two, poor compliance. And number three, poor compliance. And if you ask patients in research studies, if you ask them, are you taking your medication the way the doctor recommended? 40% of patients say no. The other 60% are probably lying. Uh, this was a wonderful study that I wish I had done. This study was actually done in Denmark where a dermatologist gave um, patients with various skin diseases uh, top, uh, um, prescriptions for medication. Now, in Denmark, they have one giant national pharmacy database. So the dermatologists were able to go to their database and look to see how long it took before the prescription was filled. Uh, the top two lines represent acne and infection prescriptions. And so you can see patients were pretty good at filling those prescriptions. They weren't perfect, you know, maybe 10% of those prescriptions weren't filled. So ideally, you'd like 100% of your prescriptions filled. 10% were not filled within one month of being prescribed the medication. Uh, in atopic dermatitis, a third of the prescriptions were not filled. And in psoriasis, half the prescriptions were not filled. Not that they weren't used. These were ones that were not even filled. I think these were patients who were probably prescribed a greasy ointment for their psoriasis. They'd probably tried many greasy ointments in the past, and they probably didn't want to try another one. But I don't know for sure. Uh, here were the first 10 patients we treated uh, in, our, in, a, in, in a psoriasis study with a topical salicylic acid preparation twice a day. And you can see a range of behaviors. The light-colored bars are what patients did according to computer chips. The dark-colored bars is what they said they did in their treatment diaries. And you see the range of behaviors. So you have here subject number seven, who used the medicine exactly the way they said they used the medicine. We have a term for this. We call this obsessive-compulsive disorder. This is, you know, an anal-retentive patient 
probably a, a certified public accountant, an architect, engineer. You recognize these people when they see you, they come. I remember years ago they would come to, you know, when I was in training 20 years ago, they'd come in with, you know, accountant paper like this book that listed every medicine that they were on and when they took it. Nowadays it's usually in the form of a multicolored Excel spreadsheet. Those patients are taking their medicine. Then you have people at the other extreme, here and here. Um, there was once a psychiatrist in the group who, when I asked, you know, what do you call this behavior, he said, well, the technical term for this is antisocial personality disorder. I have a different technical term for this. I call this normal patient behavior, okay? See, these are research subject behaviors. They've been given the medicine, so you don't have to worry about them filling it. They're coming in for all these study visits. They're highly motivated. You know, you got the, 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 um, the folks in the clinical studies team, you know, rah, rah, use the medicine and, and pumping them up to do it. And even they don't do it perfectly. But these folks are probably what more, more like what normal patients do. Now, in our first psoriasis study, we had 30 patients. Uh, here are the data for all 30 on each day of the study. So here's each day of an eight-week study. Here's the adherence to treatment. 100% adherence meant they used it twice a day. Blue dots is what they said in their treatment diaries. Red, pink dots is what they actually did, according to the computer chips. You see, the first day we gave them the medicine, they used it pretty well. But then over, time, over the first few days, the compliance drops very rapidly, and it settles into a, a slower decay over time. Um, now, you'll notice that it seems... While the data are a little noisy, it seems that every two weeks, the use of the medicine increases. What is going on in patients' lives every two weeks that makes them use the medicine better? What's that? They're coming in for a research study visit. Absolutely. This is a phenomenon that I call the dental floss effect. All right? I think that the technical term that was first applied to it is white coat compliance, but I, I think the dental floss phenomenon is a, is, a, is a clearer explanation of this. Who here, besides me, flosses their teeth every night? The anal retentive ones. Excellent. Okay. Who here flosses their teeth, like me, more before they see the dentist? Everybody does. Yeah, I, I start flossing twice a day before I see the dentist. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard patients say, in dermatology, we hear the mothers of the acne patients tell us this all the time. I don't know if you hear this in any of your fields. Doctor, it's so frustrating. You always catch it on a good day. You don't get to see what it's usually like. And, and for years, I didn't know why the moms would say this, but now I realize that acne medicines work fast. The kid starts using it three days before the visit, and I catch it on a good day. I heard a I mentioned this to a neurologist who studied Parkinson's, and she goes, oh, my God, you know, for I've been specialized in Parkinson's for eight years, and every day, every day in clinic, the spouses tell me, doctor, it's so frustrating. When you examine him, he moves just fine. At home, he doesn't move at all. You know, he can't. And, and she thought maybe the stress of the examination somehow changed his neurotransmitters when it was actually compliance with the medication in anticipation of the visit that made him you know, use, and we, we, we're familiar with this concept that you can't measure diabetes with a, a blood glucose level on the day of the visit because they took their insulin that day. What you want to see is their hemoglobin A1C to, to give you a sense of what happens over time. By the way, this is a very powerful and useful phenomenon. When I was in dermatology training, uh, the chairman of our department, this old guy, Dr. Wheeler, he said to us, when new medications are approved, use them fast before they stop working. And why did they work in the studies and not in real life? Well, because in the studies, they'd bring patients back at week one, two, four, six, eight to measure the improvement in the disease. But in doing so, they changed the improvement in the disease and the medicines would work. Then dermatologists, you know, would get the medicine and tell, they'd look at the studies and they'd say, oh, patients get better in, in, in eight to 12 weeks. So here's the medicine. I'll see you in 8 to 12 weeks. And, and, and the medicine never works as well. And if we have to, I'm just going to tell you my piano um, teacher analogy to this. My, pian, my, kids take, my kids take piano lessons. They take a lesson once a week. At the end of 8 to 12 weeks, they have a recital. 
I go to the recital, and my kids and all the other kids sound great. Why do they sound great? Because they're practicing every week. If the piano teacher said to them, you know, I got a more efficient way of doing this. We've, we've shown now that if you, take, if you practice, you know, each week, at the end of 8 to 12 weeks, the recital will sound great. So what we're going to do, we're going to have another recital in 8 to 12 weeks, but we're going to skip the weekly piano lessons. You don't need weekly piano lessons. Just practice every day and come to the recital in 8 to 12 weeks. How would that recital sound? I mean, it sounds miserable because nobody's going to start practicing until three days before the recital. It would be ridiculous for a piano teacher to tell people this. But when, when you start patients on a new drug, when do you see them back? You see them back in 8 to 12 weeks? You know, kind of like the piano teacher without the lessons? You know, so it's not surprising that people are much less adherent in real life than they are in the studies. Uh, another thing you'll notice is that the compliance is going down. It, the no, data are a little noisy, but it seems like there's a steady decay in the use of medicine over time. It's going down by about 20% every five weeks. So in 25 weeks, which is roughly six months, if it continued going down at this rate, and you, you, you can't extrapolate past the range of your data, but if you did, in, in, in six months, you would expect the compliance to go to zero. We have a term in dermatology for, for, for when the compliance goes to zero. Does anybody know the term? We call it tachyphylaxis, OK? Has anybody heard this term before? You know, it's, it's, I was taught that tachyphylaxis is the more you use these medicines over time, the less they work, that they gradually become less effective over time, probably because some, some receptor is getting downregulated somewhere. But after seeing these data, I've come to realize tachyphylaxis isn't the more you use the medicine, the less it works. It's the less you use the medicine, the less it works. Well, these are data from clinical trials. And if you do clinical trials, maybe it's of interest to you that patients aren't using their medicines. And what you'd really like to know, because you know, clinical trials patients are a select group. They're highly motivated, being paid to use the medicine, filling out you know, diaries and stuff. They're not real life patients. It'd be nice to know what real life patients do with their medicine. And I, I once proposed this idea to the um, Human Subjects Committee at Wake Forest that they let me take some kids with atopic dermatitis and give them triamcinolone ointment with these medicine, with the fancy medicine bottle cap computer chip things on them um, without telling the kids or their parents that we're monitoring them, without telling the kids or their parents that they're in, even in a research study. You know, and this is in North Carolina, not far from Tuskegee, okay? You, you know what the IRB said to me. You can imagine that they said, go ahead, do the study. And so here's what real-life patients do with their topical steroid uh, when they don't know that they're in a study. So their use of the medicine drops by about 70% in three days. It keeps going down over time. At day 28... There's a discontinuity in the curve. What happened at day 28? Came back for a one-month return visit, and then their use starts to decay again. I can get anybody's atopic dermatitis cleared up with triamcinolone. All I got to do is get them to use it for several days. How do I do that? Well, I move this one-month return visit to day seven or even day three, and it forces them to stay on the medicine, and they clear right up. It's like a miracle. Um, now, I may have, I mean, I'm just a dermatologist, so I probably don't have a lot of credibility to begin with. Coming from the South, you know, I've said some crazy things already. Don't want to lose what credibility I have, but I think it's possible that teenagers with acne are not fully compliant with the topical treatments that we recommend for them. Um, the usual, you know, uh, threshold for being considered a compliant patient in research studies is to achieve 80% compliance with, your, with the medication. You know, with, with certain medications like HIV drugs, you know, it, you want it to be a lot better than that. But the usual standard is 80%, and none of the teenagers achieved that when we gave them a once-daily topical um, acne treatment to use. Uh, their use of the medicine started off pretty good, but over six, six weeks, you know, it just goes down. So to, at the end, maybe maybe two, maybe three in 10 patients are actually still using the medicine on any given day. 
Now, um, in this study, we took teenagers with acne and we randomized them to two groups. Uh, group number one, shown in this purple color here, uh, was basically standard of care therapy. We gave them a topical therapy. We told them to come back in six weeks and 12 weeks, and we we're monitoring their use of the medicine with the, with, the, with the medicine bottle caps. And they used the medicine, you know, so-so, 50% of the time. In this second group here, we brought them back at week one, two, four, six, eight, 12, and you can see they used the medicine a bit better. Now, that's not practical. I'm not saying you ought to do that for your, your, your clinic patients. Uh, in a third group, we called the kids every day to remind them to use the medicine. That's this greenish line. Uh, and that did not seem to help at all. And then in the fourth group, we called their parents every day. And we told the parents, don't forget, remind your child to use the medicine. And as you can see, that group of kids used the medicine less than any of the other groups, which we expected. Okay, you know, I'm going to go home after several days here. I'm going to go in the kitchen when I get home, and the trash can's going to be full. I'm going to be reaching to take out the trash. If I hear my wife say, don't forget to take out the trash, I ain't doing it. She can't make me. Some people think people with bad diseases are going to take their medicines, and they don't. And adherence to biologics goes down steadily over time. It would be nice if you could measure the use of the, of the medication, of, of a, a self-injectable biologic with those computer chip containing caps, but that's not practical, is it? Well, what we did was we took basically a Clorox bottle and slapped a biohazard label on it, put the computer chip cap on top, and told patients, this is your needle disposal container. So after you give yourself the shot, throw it away in here. We did this with seven patients on adalimumab, one patient used it right, I mean perfectly right. Uh, there you can see at seven days there's the one week loading dose and then every two weeks like clockwork, same day of the week each time, patient took the medicine. This patient wasn't too bad, they missed the one week loading dose and, and, and they were in a groove taking it the same day every, every week except one week they went a week too long, they made it up by going a week too short the next time and got back on track. None of the rest of these look particularly good. You'll notice they don't pick the same day of the week each time, and, they're, and, and maybe perhaps because of that, they miss doses. Uh, here's people going, you know, months between, a month between doses. Here's somebody who goes a month, two months, three months between doses, regularly a month, two months, what is this, five weeks at 35 days, five weeks between doses, uh, six weeks between doses, this is what real-life patients are doing with, with medications. By the way, I think um, that every two-week dosing is harder to do than every one-week dosing. The reason I say that is because in Winston-Salem, North Carolina, they pick up our trash once a week. And every week, I take the trash out, no problem. Every Wednesday night, take the trash out, they pick it up Thursday. They pick up our recycling every other week. And I can never remember which week to take out the recycling bucket. Now, I got, if I want to figure it out, I either look and see what the neighbors are doing, or I, you know, pull up a calendar from the, you know, and I look on a map of the city and try to figure out which, which week my, my section of town is. But it's, it's much harder, I think, every other week than every week to remember. But one of the key things, I think, is the idea of getting in a groove. If you pick something that happens every week at the same time, and use, do the shot that, at that time, you get in the habit of doing it and you end up with a nice consistent pattern. If you don't pick the same day every time, you're at risk of missing, you know? And so the idea of developing habit, I think, is important. That's why I don't think it's critical that you bring patients back every week like piano lessons, but you have to do things up front to get patients into the habit of using their treatment. Once they're in the habit, then you can let them go off. And hopefully they'll stick with what they're supposed to do. Now, there are many reasons patients use their medicine. And if you talk to some people who study adherence, they'll tell you it's important to target what you do to the reason the patient is non-adherent. And I don't think you have to do that because I think there's some very general tools that you can use to get people to use their medicine almost no matter what the reason is that they're not using it. Uh, and some of my favorite things include uh, making sure the patient trusts you because they're not going to trust the drug company. 
They're not going to trust the insurance company. They're going to be nervous about medicine. If they take the medicine, it's because they trust their doctor. Uh, I involve them in treatment planning because in dermatology, the kinds of things we ask people to do, you know, some people don't like what we're asking them to do. I think it makes sense to make it easy for them. I try not to scare them off with side effects. I try to use treatments that work fast so they can see that it's working and they'll be encouraged to keep going. I mentioned the return visit is a powerful tool that we'll talk about in more detail. And of course, clear written instructions would be nice. However, that said, if the piano teacher who didn't have the weekly lesson said, I'm going to give you the instructions to, use, to, to practice every day in writing, I don't, I, I don't think that's going to make my kids practice every day if there's no lesson once a week. All right. So what is it that makes people trust their doctors or you know, that they're happy with their visits and trust their doctors? You know, one of the crazy little things I did in my spare time as a dermatologist is I started a doctor rating website. And so patients could rate their doctors online. Um, and so I have collected all this information from these surveys about what patients, you know, what correlates with being highly satisfied with the care they got from their doctor. I have qualitative information. I got quantitative data. Here's quantitative data. What determines patient satisfaction is whether the patient said you're a friendly, caring doctor. And that was about it. How long you keep people waiting in the waiting room is statistically significantly associated with patient satisfaction, but accounts for a tiny smidgen of the variation. How much time you spend with the patient in the exam room is statistically significantly associated with patient satisfaction, but it too accounts for only a smidgen of the variation in, 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 in um, satisfaction. What, what determines 90% of whether patients are satisfied and happy with their visit whether they thought they saw a friendly, caring doctor. How do I want to put this? Does it matter if you're a friendly, caring doctor? No, not for patient satisfaction. What matters is whether the patient thinks you're a friendly, caring doctor, all right? <laughs> now, this is, this is an important dif dichotomy. You know, I, I can say with confidence that every physician in this room is a caring doctor. They wouldn't be here at this meeting if they weren't. They want to know, they want to be up to date on treatments. They, they're going out of their way to give patients the best possible care. If they do what I used to do and walk into the room with my hands behind the back from the door of the room, make the diagnosis, the accurate diagnosis of psoriasis from the door of the room, write the prescription as I'm walking towards the patient, hand the prescription, leave the room thinking, I am a great physician. I made the right diagnosis. I made the right treatment. I care about these patients. I want them to get well. The patient may be left with a feeling like that uncaring jerk didn't examine me, didn't take time to talk to me, doesn't, doesn't care about me. I don't trust him. I certainly don't trust this medicine he prescribed, and they're not going to get well. So it's, I, it's, I'm not saying it's not important to be caring. That's, that's another issue. What I'm saying is for the purposes of of patient's adherence to treatment, what matters is whether the patient has the perception of you as a caring doctor. So what do I do now? I make the diagnosis from the door of the room. I've decided what the patient needs from the door of the room. But before I write the prescription, well, even before I open the door, I run to the door of the room because I see a lot of patients in a hurry. When I get to the door of the room, I stop and I open the door very slowly. Because if I open the door fast, people think I'm in a hurry. I am in a hurry, but I don't want people to know that. So I open the door really slowly. I go over to the wall, and I grab some of the alcohol off the wall, and I cleanse my hands, and I make a big deal of it, how this is protecting them from the flesh-eating bacteria and other evil humors of the medical environment. That way, that way if at, on the drive home they're listening to national public radio with yet another story about doctors who don't wash their hands, they're going to remember. I remember Feldman used that stuff. See, if you used it and don't make a deal out of it, and they don't even remember, then they're wondering, I can't remember if he washed his hands or not before he examined me. You know, and so, you know, it's, it's, here we are in Las Vegas, and there's shows, you know, there's great shows, and there's not so great shows, and you can learn a lot about how to put on a great show. Now, I'm not saying that, that the show is the only important thing. You have to make the right diagnosis, you have to prescribe the right treatment, but in addition to that, you know, there's an art to making patients feel cared for. After I 
introduce myself to everybody in the room uh, to make them feel like I am, an, you know, an empathetic, caring, interpersonal guy, which I am not. I am a test tube research scientist, okay? I'm a MD, PhD, protein chemist. I do it, so I'm faking what the empathetic dermatologists do, you know? I, I introduce myself, I, I get down on my knees to examine people, you know, I put my hand on their psoriasis, oh, that's a really thick plaque, and I knew it was a thick plaque from the door, but by doing this, they, 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 they realize that they're touchable, which is important, and they realize that I did a thorough examination. I pull out this giant honking magnifier with LED lights on it that I bought on eBay for just a few bucks. I hold it over the lesions, and I pretend to look through it. I often will turn my head to the residents and show them that my eyes are closed while I'm doing this. Because I don't, there's nothing this light of magnifier does for me, um, you know, in terms of telling what, whether this is psoriasis or not, or whether the mole needs to be biopsied or not, but it communicates to patients that they got a thorough examination. I, you know, every year I see my gerontologist, and she takes this stethoscope, she puts it on my back, she says, take a deep breath. I went to medical school. I never once heard anything with a stethoscope that was of any use to me whatsoever. But, you know, when she does this, it reassures me that I got a thorough physical exam. I ask them a few questions about their disease. I ask them, I bet you found the previous treatment to be really frustrating. What percent, I know you're not all dermatologists, but what, what, do you, what percent of psoriasis patients do you think found the previous treatment to be really frustrating? It's 100%, because if they had a treatment that worked for them, that cleared them up, they wouldn't be sitting there with psoriasis, right? So I get no information by asking this question. But people don't think of that. They go, Feldman understands what I'm going through. He listens to me. And it's not some open-ended question that lets them tell their whole story, okay? There are doctors who went into medicine because they like hearing the story. Show of hands. Who, who here likes hearing the whole story? We, we don't have a lot of you. Okay, great. Okay, so it's like me. You know, I went to this meeting called the Dermanities Meeting. It was a, it's the meeting of dermatology humanists. They asked me to come talk on adherence. And I went early so I could find out what they're like, you know, before I gave my talk. And um, they were reading poetry to each other. And they were talking about how they went into medicine because they like hearing patients' stories. So I got up and I'm telling them, you know, how, you know, what I do to pretend to be like them, how I fake empathy, you know? And, um, and they're like, no, you can't do that. You can't fake empathy. And I'm like, yes, I can. You know, all I have to do is do the behaviors that you guys do, and the patients cannot tell the difference. They thought I was the Antichrist. You have to address their psychosocial issues, and so I do that very, very efficiently by having patients join our National Psoriasis Foundation. Okay. Now, how people's perception of me as a caring doctor, it actually takes place before I open the door slowly, because the context of the visit can, can affect their perception. I told you about the blue vein yesterday, right? I'm going to show you the blue vein, okay? You see, you see, this is a, a digital photo of my wrist. I asked the computer to measure the color of the pixels right there. And the computer says that those pixels are actually pink, okay? So this is what we perceive as a blue vein, this color right here. Do you believe me? Let me show you what happens when I change this background. I have the computer measure the color here. I'm going to change this neutral gray background to the flesh color on either side of the vein. Check that out. I, I feel, this is the, really the coolest thing. I'm not changing the pink line. The line is not changing. You can see down here that I'm not changing the pink line. But it looks blue here. It looks pink on a neutral gray background. You see that? Is that convincing? Is that, that for, I, I, I think this deserves the Nobel Prize in medicine. You know? <laughs> if you take away the context, you see there's absolutely nothing blue there. All right? This is a very powerful illusion. You know the vein cannot be blue because you've taken blood from people and red stuff comes out of their arm. 
There's no blue pigment. The vessel wall is not blue. Now, if you dissected a cat in, in high school, yes, they pumped blue latex into the venous system. But there's nothing blue there. It just appears blue in contrast. You understand that now. You understand it can't be blue. You understand how it works. I challenge you to look at a blue vein, at the vein and, 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 and convince yourself it's pink. You cannot, okay? It still looks blue. It, you, your, your, your brain is absolutely controlled by the context, okay? The, what the, the cortex cannot override what you see. Now, this is how people, how I, I used to be presented the context of a visit to the dermatology clinic at Wake Forest, okay? People would come in, and they would see these windows that we could close off, blinds that we could cl close, that communicates to them, we may shut you out at any moment because we don't care about you. I envision that the jail in downtown Winston has similar windows and blinds, you know? Now, we have signs up that say what we do care about. This one says we care about your money. This one says we care about your money. This one says we care about your money. And unfortunately, when I took this photo, I left out the Visa and MasterCard signs, which were right there. You'll also notice that we don't care about the quality of the work we do. It's an absolute mess. People have their back turned towards you. There's nothing about this that says we care. Everything about it says we, we, we do not. The only thing we care about is your money. And if that's the context you set, okay, you know, given that the vein still looks blue, what are they going to think of me when they get in the room, you know, no matter what I do, you know? As I palpate their psoriasis, they may think, the last dermatologist didn't touch my psoriasis. Is this guy some kind of pervert? Here's a better way of presenting yourself. Here's another office that I visited, another dermatology practice I visited. It's open. They're not closing you out, okay? Uh, they've got friendly people. They're, it's neat and orderly. Notice the charts. The orderliness of this charts, you know, shows an obsessive compulsiveness about quality, okay? If this practice were to go to an EMR, I would recommend that they leave those charts, right? Leave them there just like that. To, you know, to show patients how neat and orderly and, and, you know, how they attend to detail in what they do. And their sign says, we appreciate your trust and confidence, okay? That's, that's a way to, to set a context for people. Okay. Now, I'm going to check my watch here, see how we're doing. Um, uh, I, I'm doing, I'm checking my watch now, uh, not because I'm in a hurry, uh, but because I care about you, I, I want to finish on time so you can get to the next lecture and all. Um, I actually didn't even need to look at my watch. So you can't see it, but right there, they've got a timer for me telling me how I'm doing. Kind of like what you should have in your office, a clock behind where the patient sits. If you're old enough, you know that this is the moment that George Bush lost the election to Bill Clinton. Does anybody remember that? In the national debates, there was Clinton, Bush, and Perot sitting on the stage. And in the middle of the debate, George Bush looks at his watch, and the American people said, this jerk does not care about us. He's in a hurry to get out of here. And he lost the election at, when he did that. And so I caution you, do not look at your watch when you're with a patient, okay? It just it communicates to them that you don't care about them. So... It's okay to look at a clock. Just make sure the clock is right behind their head, you know, is the way you've positioned them in your examination rooms. Okay, uh, other things that you can do. Uh, in dermatology, we're giving people topical therapy. Dermatology, I think, I don't know, maybe GI things are bad for compliance. But in, in dermatology, things are horrible because we're, we're not just having people try to take a pill, which is easy. We're having them take this slop and rub it on themselves, you know, and that's, that's asking a lot of folks. It's much more time-consuming and difficult. Dermatologists were taught when you have patients with a dry, scaly rash like psoriasis, give them a, a greasy ointment to put on. Patients hate putting on greasy ointments, or at least some do. Uh, in this study, we had patients with psoriasis compare different products, an ointment, a gel, a cream, a solution product, a foam. The solution and the foam are much less messy, and patients preferred them. So this, this dogma in dermatology that you have to give people with psoriasis ointments is ridiculous. There's one vehicle that works better than all the others. Does anybody know which one it is? The one they'll use. That's exactly right. So I have lots of options, 
And I find out what the, if the patient says, oh, Dr. Feldman, I like greasy ointments for my psoriasis. I like the way they feel on my skin. I like the way they, they seem to hang around. I like the way the scale disappears when I put it on. I give them an ointment. But if they say, Dr. Feldman, I'm not so sure about these ointments. They're kind of messed up. I'm like, no problem. We'll find something else that you, that, that you won't mind using. Um, this was such dogma in dermatology, it was hard to convince dermatologists that you didn't have to use an ointment. Now, one of the things I would explain to them is that, you know, infliximab and methotrexate and cyclosporin, they clear up the psoriasis, and they're not ointments. You know, you don't have to moisturize the lesions to get them to clear up. All you got to do is get rid of the inflammation. And a topical can do that, you know. Topicals can be very effective. There was one topical that was more effective than any topical ever seen for psoriasis. There was a study done where they took people with psoriasis and they did biopsies. They had them the put, here's the baseline. You see the thick uh, epidermis, the thick scale, the micropustules, dilated blood vessels, inflammation. They had the patient put this, this topical on, and in two days, the inflammation is disappearing. The epidermal thickness is beginning to normalize. In two weeks, all that thick scale had fallen off. The epidermis is now down to a normal level. The inflammation is pretty much gone. Anybody know which topical this was? This was a product called Skin Cap. This was a zinc pyrithione spray product sold by a company out of, I believe it was Macarena, Spain, Keminova International. Zinc pyrithione, the active ingredient in head and shoulders. And if you go back to 1997, dermatologists, there's a dermatologist who had a, had a, um, a diary in, in one of our journals, he and his wife, and they wrote, the big news is skin cap coming out of Spain, sweeping the country, make no mistake about it, it's good. I don't have any psoriasis practice anymore. They all use skin cap. We don't need steroids, nuncted, ingested, or injected. They had, they had somebody try it for, for psoriasis on the legs, resistant to therapy, cleared up like, like, like that. And they, they had a patient with resistant scalp psoriasis. Uh, had failed everything. They put them on skin cap, and in four days, the patient came back, exclaimed, it's a miracle! And the scalp was completely clear. Zinc pyrithione, they thought they had discovered the cure for psoriasis. There was only one problem. The company making this stuff had been putting clobetazole in the cans and wasn't telling anybody. Now, dermatologists were scratching their heads. I don't understand because this patient had already failed clobetazole ointment. And ointments are more potent. It can't be the clobetazole. It must be the clobetazole plus the zinc pyrithione in combination that creates this magical effect that clears the psoriasis. Why would zinc make clobetazole more effective? Anybody take their boards recently? Yeah, so steroid receptors have zinc fingers. So maybe by giving them zinc, you know, you, you somehow enhance the power of the clobetazole. Well, we did a study where we had people put clobetazole on both sides, zinc pyrithione on one side, zinc pyr no zinc pyrithione on the other side. The side that got the zinc did worse than the side that didn't get the zinc. It wasn't statistically significant, but there was no sign the zinc helped at all. And it wasn't due to better penetration because whether you use a, a, a branded clobetazole formulation or this skin cap material, you get good penetration either way. There were three reasons skin cap worked so well. Can anybody name one of the three reasons for me? Compliance. Compliance. Excellent. Yes, this was a spray-on product, dried right out. It was so much easier than a nasty, greasy ointment. Patients used it better. Can anybody give me another reason why this stuff worked better? Compliance. Compliance. Yes, because when you give people clobetazole, you know, in the dermatology office, you might say to them something like, this is the most powerful steroid known to man. If you use this for more than two weeks, seriously bad things are going to happen to you. Patients go home, they open the package insert, they read it, they go, oh my God, it's worse than she said. And she's just a dermatologist, I don't know. They come back and they're like, doctor, I use the medicine religiously, it doesn't work, we need to try something else. Can anybody think of a third reason that this stuff worked? And by the way, you give them skin cap, they didn't know there was a clobetazole. They, they just put it on willy-nilly, you know, with no worries about side effects. Anybody think of a third reason patients use this stuff? Compliance. Compliance, yes, because the skin cap was something that they paid for themselves, okay? 
I don't know, did you have to pay any extra to, to come to this lunch? No, and that's why there's empty seats, you know? See, people are invested in something, you know, and they, they paid for the skin cap. Their insurance company bought them the, the clobetazole. So if the insurance company buys them the clobetazole, they don't use it. If they spend 50 bucks to buy a can of this stuff, they're going to use it. The best example of this ever happened to me, I put on a psoriasis meeting at Wake Forest one January on a Saturday. We had uh, six hours of sessions at six CME hours. The CME office asked me, what do you want to charge as a registration fee? And I said, charge? I don't want to charge anything because I got buckets of drug company money funding this event. We don't need to charge the people anything. And the CME office said, oh, yes, you need to charge them for this because if you don't charge them, they're not going to show up. So I said, okay, $15 registration fee for the six hours of CME credit. Turns out that Saturday there was a freak ice storm in the Carolinas. And we don't handle ice very well where we are, okay? Even if, if, if they predict that it might snow, they close the schools in North Carolina. And they're not going to clean the roads, okay? The ice storm, it's bad. This dermatologist from West Virginia came over the mountains, up and down, over the ice to this meeting because he had 15 bucks invested, okay? If he hadn't paid those 15 bucks, I am sure he would not have imperiled his life to come to this meeting. And, and you know, we, we now have a branded clobetazole spray, and that works great for clearing up psoriasis.